Well, last week, uh, let's see where Tammy's got me set up here. There we go. Last week, we left off in Matthew 23. Because now we're looking at um, false teachers. How are, are they to be exposed? Is that uh, an avenue that we should take? And we began with pointing out then that first of all, Christ exposed them. Okay, so we looked at, we're looking in Matthew 23, and I think we got to, uh, uh, I didn't mark down, I think verse 15. We looked at, uh, how the Pharisees were treating the widows, didn't we? If I recall correctly. Um, the fact that they were acting very pious and loving and helpful to the widows, and yet they were taking their money and taking over the management of their properties, all for their gain. And Christ condemned them for that. So we're in verse uh, 15, uh, Matthew 23 and verse 15. Um, Annie, I'll get you to read that, please. 15. Uh, 15, yes. Woe to you, the scribes and the Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cross sea and land to make a single uh, convert, and you make the new convert twice. Okay, so we see here then, Christ is condemning them. Um, is he condemning them for making proselytes? No. No, no right. No, they, what he's condemning is the mentorship, the turning out like the, the Pharisees. Right, Lord, right. He's not condemning... Um, the Jewish people at that time for um, proselyte was a Gentile that was converted to Judaism. Jesus wasn't condemning them for that. He was condemning them for making one a proselyte to human terms, their terms, rather than God's words, wasn't he? Um, and then he, he points out uh, their attitudes they make every means, Jesus said, every effort to gather followers. And they, they spared no pain to, to gain a proselyte. But they didn't convert them to God's word, did they? They, they converted them to what they thought, to their teachings. And Christ condemns them for that. And naturally, because they were the religious leaders, right? They were supposed to be honest with the people. Um, so then verse 24, uh, verse 24, Sandra, I'll get you to, to read that, please. You blind guys that strain out the knot and swallow the camel. Okay. Anybody want to throw a thought out of what Christ said? Is mowing them there for? And then uh, I'll give you my verse, thought. Oh. In the previous verse, in verse 23, he talked about them paying so close attention to the smaller parts of the law that they left out the larger parts of the law. Uh, he, he, he's not condemning them for tithing men in and human, just as he wasn't condemning them for proselyte. Uh, but he was saying, you, you, you left out faith, mercy, and uh, 
small little things you're, you're you, you might have like water and you have bugs in them and you're straining out those bugs and you're swallowing camels the ironic thing about that statement is those are both unclean animals under the law of Moses. They're coming along and saying, well, we can't eat the gnats. They're unclean. But well, we're going to swallow the camels. Well, they're unclean too. Uh, and and so he's saying, you're, you're, you're hypocritical. You're saying, well, you got to follow the small things, but these big things, they don't matter. R- right. Both of them. That's right, Chair. That's right. They... As Jared pointed out, they were worrying um, about the the analogy of the gnat. I thought was kind of interesting. They're just simply uh, flies, but they aren't good flyers, so they would fall into the the milk, um, and the Pharisees would strain the milk because of that one little gnat. And uh, Jesus wasn't condemning that type of sanitation, if you will. But here they are, as Jeremy said, straining out the knot, and yet these are the ones that stoned Stephen for preaching the gospel. Um, You know, with their own hands. So they're worrying about all the little um, nitpick things that have really nothing to do with uh, with the gospel, but and yet we see them stoning Stephen. Um, I thought that kind of points out their hypocrisy, if you will. So our next two verses was 25, our 25 and 26. Um, Jeff, I'll get you to read those then. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of extortion and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first cleanse the inside of the cup and dish, that the outside of them may be clean also. Okay. Um, what, uh, what do we see here? We see another imbalance. Jeremy just pointed out their imbalances in their thinking. Um, the witch chair? If you, if you wash your dishes it, and, and you clean the uh, inside of the dish, then all the inside of the dish is so clean. The, and then when you take a look at the outside of the dish, and it's just filled and is someone really going to want to heat off that dish? Because you really didn't clean it. And, and so, like as far as he's, he's saying, he's saying, uh, uh, well, and he actually has the other side. And he took the other way around. But he had the outside of the dish actually clean. The inside's not. The inside's the part you use. Right. And is so someone going to eat off a dirty dish? You're coming along and Saying that that which is, it is, you're saying that which is filthy is actually clean. Yep. It's not. Their lives, the outside may have looked clean. The inside, Jesus said, the, the heart from where the heart is. Yep. That's that, that's what defines the man. Right. What comes from within. And so, if you're if you're going to come along and teach that uh, you're righteous, you better be righteous. You better be you better be following. Your spiritual life, that better be righteous, not just what looks too ugly. Right. And and yet they put on that show, and yet they were robbing widows. They were robbing orphans. Um, they, they dealt deceitfully and money changing um, in the moral precepts of, of the law. Um, so we see the double standards don't we? Um, And Christ is condemning them for that. And verse 27, uh, verse 27, where are we at? Uh, Sandra, did you read? Yeah, Gord. Or Gord, you read, didn't you? No? Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. 
For you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead man's bones and all uncleanliness. Okay. I found this a, an interesting analogy, and I had to do a little studying to figure out um, what the Lord was getting at there. But another figure that he's drawn from them, from the scribes and the Pharisees, that was in those days, um, they would whitewash old graves, old gravestones, uh, the heads, so you would know where they were, so as not to step on them. Um, and Jesus, I believe, used this figure because the teachers, the scribes and the Pharisees, um, they were so clean, so beautiful in their in their dress on the outside. That's what they were always showing. But inwardly, um, they were full of wickedness. They were dead spiritually and morally. And Jesus could see through this uh, attractive veneer, if you will, this attractive show that they would put on of, of political and social and religious respectability. Um, and Jesus could see that, Jeff. Verse 28 is the part you're referring to is where he makes a comparison to them <clears throat> that they also outwardly appear right people. We need to be careful of that people who have an appearance of righteousness just by looking uh, but when we examine uh, the fruits, uh, we find that no, it's not right. It's not according to God's will. It's right. Made. Right. Not men, not God. Exactly. Um, you know, there is within these passages um, lots for us ourselves to examine ourselves, isn't it? Um, we may not be robbing the widows and the orphans but yet that verse is one that makes you think it's not hard to put up on an outward appearance and yet behind backs and different situations you know being full of hypocrisy Chair? remember dealing with the dead under the law of Moses made you ceremonially and so why did the Pharisees want to do this? Well, because they said, well, we don't want to be unclean under the law. So we'll whitewash these tombs, but we don't step on the, the dead man's tombs and, and become involved with the dead. We don't want to be seen like that. Jesus was saying, well, if you do that because you recognize, okay, you don't want to do that, but you're not clean. Inwardly, right. you're still filthy. And inwardly, like as far as you, you come along and take a look at all these outward signs of, oh, I'm physically clean, I'm physically clean, and that's therefore okay. You're fornicators, you're thieves, you're, you're all of these other things. God affords that. Uh, as well, you can't come along and say, well, I'm physically clean, therefore that's enough. No. You had to be spiritually clean, as you're saying. Yeah. You can't just appear outwardly as clean and think that that's okay if your heart is full of sin. Right. Exactly. We see that even today in in the, our denominational world, and marvel at the outward appearances that a lot of the um, so-called pastors and teachers of our day put forward. Um, our last verse then is uh, verse thirty-three. Verse 33, Kala. I'll get you to read that, please. Uh, Matthew 23, 33? Is that what Kala read? Oh, okay, sorry. So here, what... Uh, I thought of Jesus' language... Um, you know, we think of the parables, how we related stories, daily 
physical stories to have us draw our attention to the spiritual uh, lessons that he wants to teach. But he also, his language was meta metaphorical in a lot of cases, wasn't it? Um, remember Herod? What Jesus called Herod? Remember Jesus called Herod a fox? You know, fox is cunning, that he's after one thing, food. Um, and the opponents of the gospel, uh, false teachers, we just read that last week, he called them wolves in sheep's clothing, didn't he? And that helps draw our attention. We see a picture, don't we? We see a, the spiritual meaning behind that. And here, um, he compares the scribes and Pharisees. And to my way of thinking, it's, it's the most detestable of all creatures. Uh, serpents. I don't know about you guys, but when we go camping, we see a snake, we're pretty quick to get out of that guy's way. Um, and he, he speaks of them as poisonous ones at that, vipers. Um, you know, that's a pretty crude comparison isn't it, that he has them to think about. And, and just thinking, I, I thought in Jeremy's last comment, um, is it any wonder that the scribes and Pharisees just hated Christ? They just loathed him because he called them for what they were. He showed them what they were, didn't he? And Gord? Well, a brood of vipers really describes how they were because they were poisoning the people's it, minds with all this false doctrine. They were just sheer poison. Right. You know, so a rightful name yeah. to those people of what they were doing. Exactly. And they should have listened to that, shouldn't they? They should have taken, if we will, constructive criticism, and yet it just... It just grew to more hatred. Hatred that, in the end, they crucified. Mm -hmm. Jeff? If they had it taken constructive criticism, they would have never got to this point. Right. I mean, at some point in time, you just had to be outright blunt with them. Yeah. It's worth, the, it's worth thinking about um, during this time when Jesus was on the earth. These people had the Old Testament. Right. They had Moses and the prophets. For them to look back, they believe Moses and the prophets. They talk about how they're Moses' the disciples. And they would have you know, understood the false teaching and false teachers that were in the Old Testament. Yeah. They would have recognized that. They recognized that Moses and the prophets were true. But how come they couldn't see it? that day when it's happening around them and when they're involved in it. Which, of course, I think about now. Everybody can look back in Jesus' time and see the scribes and the Pharisees and see how false they were. Yeah. How come nowadays people aren't willing or capable of understanding the false teaching, the false teachers of today? It's a definite connection to attitude. Yeah. We can see it in the past, but we are unwilling to see it in the present. Yeah, exactly. It makes you wonder. I was thinking about that this morning as, you know, I got to thinking about uh, the Jews, the Muslims, and I thought they all claim someone, mostly Moses, um, they all claim those men as prophets and they take only part of what they taught and it ends there and then they insert their um, their thoughts, their creeds, if you will. Um, you know, I, when you think of the Catholics, um, 
You know, we wear our crosses around our neck to, to show oh, we're Christians. No. no, you're Catholics. And you listen to your Pope who does not follow what God says. Um, and yet, you're right. Why? Kind of goes back to our first lesson. Why do we do it? It's, it's tradition or... You know, family follows that, so I'm going to follow it. Mm -hmm. well, I think possibly one of the things is to look back at old times and to see the false teaching and expose it. It doesn't cost us anything because it's years ago. What? But if we're willing to expose false teaching now in our own lives and around us, then we might have to, that might cost us something to open our mouth. Uh, well. Make it easier just to look in the past and say, Oh, I see that false teaching. I'm not so willing to see it right now. Yeah, exactly. Go. Once I invited and I exposed to population, I was going to Monday Harmony at that time. And she said, But there's nothing significant about your church. Even the preacher did not dress so. When she's comparing it to the Catholic church with long gowns and looking holier and down and holier and down and the glass panes in the window, you know, they're so beautiful that they have. And I said, what are you there for? For a show or for the, to hear the word of God? Yeah. Which is it? But she didn't really like that. So that, you know, they're accustomed to that powerful religion, big thing, and, and which they copied from the, these Pharisees and Sadducees. So that's what they like. Yeah, exactly. The outward, the outward show, isn't it? It's amazing. So we move on then to. Uh, we saw that Christ exposed the false teachers, and now we see that the apostles also. First um, Timothy, five and verse twenty. Paul instructs this young preacher, Timothy, here. He says, those, tells Timothy, those who continue in sin rebuke in the presence of all so that the rest also may be fearful of sinning. Um, there will be those who will need to be reminded that uh, the apostles here were directed by the Holy Spirit to expose false teachers. Um, that they had the authority. And in this case, with Paul speaking to Timothy, when this, the sin is uh, a public thing affecting those around you in the church, then Paul tells them, you rebuke them in the presence of all. This isn't speaking about we have personal problems with someone else and we go to them and we speak with them privately. We don't need to bring it out in front of everyone. But when the, the sin is involving and affecting all the members, then it's Paul that's saying, you know, um, rebuke that person in the presence of all. Um, that may not be an easy thing to do, but we see why. Because then we'll all be fearful of sin. It will help us, won't it? And the apostles, we hear it all the time. Well, at least I've heard people say, well, that was the apostles. Uh, that wasn't Christ, so we don't need to follow that. Well, their words are as authoritative as if Christ was speaking, aren't they? Remember, before Christ ascended to the Father, uh, here is what he said to the apostles in Acts 1 and 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria even to the remotest part 
of, of the earth. So we see their authority. Carlos? I don't, we don't do that in Philippines. Like, we don't have that kind of Right. Because that's going to, I don't know who we're going to take it, uh, who's going to take that. In the presence of all, <laughs> they might even get up and give the people, the person who's doing it, a good tongue lashing. I don't see that working on to be honest with you, I've never seen it done. I have seen this fellowship in certain congregations, even with um, when, a, when an elder is supposed to be not doing what he should. Right, right. Well, Paul is speaking here to Timothy, to a preacher, to Timothy. He was um, preaching at, at this time. I'm not sure when he was in Tim. I'm not sure what congregation. Maybe Jerry would know um, yeah. where. Where was Timothy at this yeah. time? Oh, okay, in Ephesus. Oh, okay, okay. Um, Yes. And uh, so we, we sometimes, sometimes uh, things happen in private. And Jesus said, deal with private things in private. Right. Like I said, it doesn't affect, even if it's sin, it doesn't affect the entire congregation. Let's try to, let's try to deal with some things that just affect us privately. And, uh, but if, if there is sin involved in the congregation, or if there was an attitude uh, that was wrong, sometimes the best thing a preacher can do is preach a lesson on it. Right. And if the people hear of a lesson, they should be convicted, just like in Act 2. Peter called them out as murderers, but he built up to that point. Now, he didn't start the lesson saying, you're murderers, you need to repent. He built them up to the point, this is who Jesus was, this is what he did, this is who he is now. And you put him to death. Right. And then I hear from you. So, that's a possibility. Yeah, no, that's, uh, there is the thought, too, of uh, humbleness, of uh, how we should act with one another. Um, and that falls into when there's sin, something needs to be exposed. But I've I found a, I thought of an extraordinary example of the power of the apostles. I, I kind of started heading towards them because um, I've been told in some discussions where the apostles do not have the authority to teach me. I don't need to follow the, the authority of the apostles, only of Christ. And I've, I've tried to show them that no, the apostles have that authority. Christ gave it to him. And I thought of, uh, remember Paul when he was teaching uh, Sergius Paulus? And I found it interesting. Okay, Sergius Paulus was a man who asked to hear Paul. Okay, that was in Acts 13. Uh, maybe I'll just turn there. Acts 13. Uh, 6 to 11 um, and we see when Paul and uh, let's see verse 6 uh, when they'd gone through the island to uh, Paphos they found a certain sorcerer a false prophet a Jew whose name was Bar Jesus who was with the pro council so here we have the false prophet and he he's in a, a political position uh, higher up and this man, Sergius Paulus, and it's interesting, we're told he's an intelligent man, and he called for Barnabas and Saul, or Paul, and he wanted to hear the word of God. Um, and then we read, but Elimaeus, the sorcerer, um, he 
interrupts. He is trying to lead this Sergio Paulus away from what Paul is, is teaching. Um, he's causing confusion. Um, and it's interesting, um, and it tells us that Paul is filled with the Holy Spirit, and he looks intently at this man, at this false prophet. Um, he is... You know, we see the seriousness of, of what he is doing. Because verse set, 10, we read, Paul says, O full of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? And now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you, it's interesting. See, Paul gives that power to God. And you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately a dark mist fell on him, and he went around seeking someone to lead him by hand. Um, I found that interesting that, you know, how God dealt through Paul with this uh, false prophet here. Um, you know, we... I can't do those things now and are at it. we're taught how to deal we'll look at that in our next lesson but here we see uh, the apostle Paul he had that authority and this false prophet is interrupting uh, a man that wants to hear the word of God and Paul dealt with him <laughs> this is what you know this is how I'm going to deal with you um, but I just found that the seriousness of, of that matter at that time. So we'll move on then. Um, and then just this thought, um, Paul was sent by Christ to the Gentiles. Remember, Christ appeared to Paul on the, the road to Damascus. And Paul knew his responsibilities as an apostle, didn't he? And we just saw where he dealt with this false prophet, um, and rightly so. But his love for the brethren moved him to always warn uh, of false teachers. Uh, 1 Timothy 1, verse 19 to 20. Uh, we'll go to uh, Jeremy, please. First Timothy, nineteen to twenty. Um, having faith in good conscience, having faith in a good conscience, which some having rejected concerning the faith of suffered shipwreck. Of whom Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I delivered to Satan, that they may learn not to blast. Okay, now Paul's reminding, we're reminding ourselves, keep in mind Paul's goal, okay, his love for us, his love for the brethren at that time, um, so as to warn them. And, and what does he say here about uh, Hymenaeus and Alexander, about their state? How does that leave us to think? The they were handed over to Satan, meaning um, they had to be disfellowship. Oh. They, they couldn't continue like that. So they had to go. R right. So. Yeah. That's right, Kyle. And what does he say about their faith? Right, Jer. Right. Um, not too many ships that are in a shipwreck, sail again. Um, you know, it seems at this point, um, it seems there's no return for them, isn't it? I'm not saying that God wouldn't accept their forgiveness, but it's telling me that it's possible to reach a point 
when you shipwreck your faith, you reach the point where there's no return. You know? And second, uh, which is a warning, isn't it? Paul gives a, a warning. And second Timothy 2, verses uh, 16 to 18, um, Naomi, please. Okay, um, this passage I thought back to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, but what are they, what are they denying here, Hymenaeus and uh, Philetus? What are they denying? Future resurrection. Re exactly, Joe. They're denying the resurrection of Christ, the very basis isn't it, um, of our hope. And then what were they, were they just satisfied with keeping that to themselves? Oh, we don't believe in the resurrection. Is that where it ends with them? No, it seems to spread to Rome, which is like, it, it, it's partly like the angry, like the religion of the Dead Sea. The is very hard to hear. So they will just spread it around and poison, poison it to be goods, it, poisonous. Exactly. The cancer spread it. Exactly, Kyle. They were pushing their theory on others, weren't they? They weren't happy unless they were dragging someone else down, weren't they? Um, we'll do our last one quick. Now we'll end this section. Third John. Third John. Um, Nine to ten. Tammy, have you got that handy? Okay, thank you. Um, Jared dealt with uh, this man in the sermon a while back. Um, but I thought here of pa Paul was telling Timothy in, in a situation that might arise with him, you know, you, you correct these people in front of all. But here John is exposing, letting the church know he's going to deal with Diotrephes. Uh, he had a domineering nature within the church. Was, was keeping out those he didn't want in. John is an apostle. We'll deal with that when I come. So we see their authority. I'm not ashamed to...